This is Justin with a quick note before today's show. I know that some of you are traveling frequently on deployments with limited connectivity, so I've put together a deployment kit. It's a flash drive with 80 episodes, including ones I haven't yet released on the show, as well as ebooks and a PDF of all the show notes. Check it out on the resources tab at beyondtheuniform.io. Thanks and enjoy the show. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. Today's episode number 77 with Mike Freed. And I started to try to kind of reverse what I had been doing already, which was complaining with everybody else, and started to notice that um, I was able to develop a presence because, you know, I'd been there before. That case team might as well have been in, you know, trying to fix some pump in the engine room of a, of a sub on, on, on mission. And then people were frustrated that they were there and that things weren't going the way they wanted. That lesson, I think, helped me get promoted faster at Bain because I started to lead on teams outside of the reporting structure just because I was able to be a, a, for, a kind of a, a mature force on the team at times and kind of help drive attitude before I was able to, to add value at a leadership level. The top two reasons to listen to today's show are, number one, consulting. Mike spent six years in consulting with Bain & Company and has mentored many veterans who have worked in consulting. He's got great advice on managing one's career, a typical career progression within Bain, mistakes that he made, and more. Number two, leadership. Mike talks about how within consulting, veterans are often frustrated that they start out as an individual contributor rather than a manager, which more closely matches their previous military experience. He talks about how you have the ability to lead in any organization, no matter what your role is, and has a lot of great insights on taking care of your team, challenging your people, and utilizing your best leadership skills from the military in your civilian career. As always, at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find show notes for this episode with links to everything we discuss, as well as a directory of veteran resources, ebooks, and recommendations for other websites, podcasts, and ebooks. If you're interested in any of those books, Audible.com is offering Beyond the Uniform listeners a free audiobook of your choosing. You can find out more at beyondtheuniform.io slash books. So with that, let's dive in to my interview with Mike Freed. Joining me today in Atlanta, Georgia is Mike Freed. Mike, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. So for listeners, I wanted to give a little bit of information on Mike's background. Mike is the president of the Health Physics Division at Myriad Technologies, which is a provider of radiation detection and monitoring products and services to the nuclear power, medical, military, and homeland security markets. He started out at Northwestern University, after which he was an officer in the Navy for 10 years, serving on submarines and as as well as on the Chief of Naval Operations personal staff. After the Navy, he received his MBA from the Darden School of Business, after which he worked at Bain & Company for nearly six years as a principal. So, Mike, to start off, I always like to learn about the point at which you knew you were going to leave the Navy and how you approached that decision. Sure, sure. Yeah, the uh, for me it was actually uh, a moment where our, our submarine had had pulled into Portsmouth shipyard, and so we weren't going out to sea for a while. Um, it, I always blame it on my wife, but it, I don't want to give give blame because it's a key life moment for me. But I met my wife at the time and just decided that um, after ten years it was time to to, to move on. And I actually didn't plan the way that most plan. I wasn't type A about it. I didn't go through, you know, 15 different business school applications. I, I, I was a little bit of a procrastinator about it. I knew I wanted to move on. And I wasn't really sure what to do. So uh, she was living in Virginia at the time and I had a friend that had gone to Darden. And so um, I applied to Darden. It was the only school I applied to. And uh, luckily looking back on it, I was accepted. Except that's definitely not the, uh, the approach I would recommend to others getting out. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was a really tough decision for me because you know, it was a balance between, you know, wanting a little bit more of a stable lifestyle with, with family, um, but I wasn't someone that was running away from the Navy because I, I really loved it. So, And how did you choose business school versus going straight into industry? And, and do you have any advice for those thinking of pursuing an MBA? Yeah, I actually, I think part of it was knowing that I wanted to get out, but not having any idea what I, what I wanted to do. And I had enough friends that were in business school that, that made it clear to me that it's a, it's a two year time where you can both kind of soul sort, 
uh, Soul Search as well as as develop and also it's a you know it's a recruiting ground so I wouldn't have to go out and go through job fairs and and also it was a little bit of a you know fear of commitment where I didn't want to blindly pick an industry not really knowing what it would look like and start a course towards that and so the business school piece. Um, for me is incredibly important. Uh, you know, it's a pretty common path. A lot of people do it. And, and I would 100% recommend it just because it, it buys you a little bit of time to, um, to to think about your next chapter in a way that you're not able to when you're wrapping up your time of service. And what led you to Bain and, Com- uh, and Company? It, it, I think Bain and Company to me was... Um, an extension of that, that fear of commitment. You know, I I thought I would get to business school and I would, you know, get exposed to a a topic or uh, an industry or a company on campus that would make me realize, you know, that's what I want to do with my life. But um, the more time that that went on at school and the first fall, the more I realized, you know, consulting was pretty appealing because it was an extension of um, exposure and perspective and it's also, you know, to me, the consulting companies and, and Bain in particular had this aura of, um, you know, being one of the top firms and being able to be exposed to pretty challenging problems. And um, if you take, you know, a long time ago, someone gave me advice that as you're thinking about life decisions, just make sure you choose something that, you know, kind of ultimately ends in exponential optionality, so to speak. And so, for me, Bain was, was a chance to continue to open doors and, and frankly, buy time until I could figure out, you know, what I wanted to do long term. And the other thing I would say about Bain and, you know, not to get into an advertising pitch for Bain, but this is probably broadly important as you're figuring out what the next step is out of, out of the, the services. Culture is so incredibly important to me. Um, you learn on a sub stuck underwater in the middle of nowhere away from friends and, and family that um, no matter how hard it gets, as long as you, you know, trust and enjoy and have fun with the people around you, anything, you, you can kind of get through anything. And so I evaluated the companies that I was considering at, at Darden um, through that same lens. You know, the, the first gate for me was, do I like these people? Do I culturally align with them? Do I, I feel like they're people I can trust? And so that was kind of the first piece. And while you were at Bain, what were some of the projects that you worked on that you really enjoyed? So at, at Bain, you know, Bain's a, a generalist firm, which means you don't really get put in, in one path to a, a specialty like, you know, healthcare or, um, you know, the different different verticals. That, and so what it does is it exposes you to uh, many different industries and types of cases. So I worked on everything from a, uh, a cost reduction case for a, a large grocery store um, chain um, to the other end of the spectrum where I was working in what we called our private equity group, which does a number of three-week diligences, which are kind of mini cases jammed into three weeks where you evaluate companies that private equity firms are looking to buy. And, you know, the number one thing I think I learned across all of it was just as you start to feel like you're learning an industry and a company and a certain approach, whether it's cost-cutting strategy, merger integration, what, what have you, to get pulled and dropped into another type of case because the case ends and you have to start something else. And so what I really learned was um, how to learn just enough to, to be dangerous quickly, um, how to, to, you know, to problem solve around a framework that would work regardless of, of um what you're looking at, mainly just an approach, uh, uh, being careful about not trying to go too deep because you didn't have too much time and making sure that you were focusing on what's most important and where the value is and, and those types of lessons. And so it was really this ongoing, uh, I'd say for the first two years at Bain, just continual discomfort, getting thrown in areas where I wasn't necessarily um, an expert but had to rapidly become one that I think conditioned me you know, to realize we're going to move around a lot in our careers, and that's probably the most valuable lesson I got was the, the first first two two years at Bain, where I had to um, basically learn how to learn again, and um, that that's carried forward to both to the rest of the time at Bain and now in this new position. So, 
I, I can imagine um, always shifting around like that. It keeps you constantly. Um, it keeps you from getting comfortable. And so I can imagine that's like somewhat awkward to always feel like you're learning something new, but also I can imagine how much you learn in such a compressed amount of time because you are constantly exposed to new things. Yeah. And, and, and frankly, that's where, um, you know, I, I learned, I felt this a little bit at Darden. I didn't realize it until I was at Bain. That's where I, I found the first time that I actually had, um, a little bit of, of conditioning from, from my time in the service that I had to, to overcome. And, you know, one thing that was, a, 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 I think, a gap between me and my peers when I started Bain was um, everyone had a more of an inherent confidence in this role of, you know, I may not know everything, but I'm going to step into this new case or this new environment and, and have this kind of moxie about me because I'm sure I'll be able to figure it out. Whereas I had this kind of anchor where I was constantly um, – uh, afraid of, of, of not having enough credibility, not having put in enough work, not not having, um, you know, the um, respect of others that I, you know, in the military over a long period of time worked to, to achieve. And, um, you know, it's not that those are bad feelings to want to drive to um, earn the respect and credibility of others, but it it certainly was an unnecessary handicap that I put on myself in the beginning to, to almost believe that I, I couldn't achieve that in a short period of time or I, I had a reason not to be confident at the outset. And so um, over time, I think I learned that, that once I got beyond that, then there was really nothing kind of holding me back compared to my peers who maybe had a little bit more direct experience than me. Mm. And how did your job change over time at Bain, in, in both in terms of the title as well as what you did day to day? Yeah, it's um, you, as you start and um, it's 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 doing analytical kind of individual contributor work where you know it, the, the concept is in order to someday be a partner at Bain, you need to remember how or know how the, the toolkit works and have done some of the analytics and you know before you um, lead the team, it's like the Marine. Everyone's a rifleman. Everyone's an analyst uh, at at Bain at least a little bit, so you can understand. Um, approaches and frame problems as a leader going forward. And so the first um, year, it was a lot of given a work stream, you know, some subcomponent of a problem, go analyze it, come up with answers, work with clients to to frame frame your part of the story. And, and then over time, you start to be the one that's crafting that story uh, over bigger slices of the overall deliverable for a client. And then you know, maybe you start to have in this the, near the end of the first year a new analyst out of college reporting to you, and very quickly in that second year, things pivoted to where I found myself um, found myself leading a, a, a full case team. I my wife had our, our first baby when we were at Bain, and I left went on. Um, I had to be local because I didn't want to travel near the end of of, of her pregnancy. And so they put me back in the private equity group where I'd been before, and, and they gave me a full team. And so I went from being someone who had one person reporting to me to having you know a full team in three weeks to solve a, a, a private equity diligence. And so it pivots really fast to where you get into a leadership role, which is, I think, for vets, I've noticed in consulting, you get a little bit um, tired of the individual contributor work, even though you know it's important and you know you have a lot to learn and, and, you know, Excel skills or analytics that, you know, maybe you don't catch in business school, you get a little bit frustrated and want to lead. And then all of a sudden that leadership uh, comes and hits you like a train because it's a pretty tough job. And so then I I think that went transition really quickly into manager for me. I think I got promoted in uh, a little over uh, two years at Bain to, to manage two and a half years to manager. And then, um, then that just, I was a manager for about three years or so. I got three and a half years uh, leading cases for clients, which was hugely fulfilling because you have this weird uh, kind of triangle where you're fighting three fronts. You're, you're trying to make the best experience for the team and give them meaningful work and keep them inspired and, and train them. You're, um, you're entering to the client, and so you usually have a little bit more of a, a senior client, what we call the map, where you're linked to a... Uh, a handful of direct clients and in this case when you get more senior they're more the C-level type executives and then you have the uh, 
the leadership at Bain, you know, the partners and, and people that you're trying to manage and plug in to the, uh, to the answer the best way. So it's a really dynamic um, environment that, that, that shapes you pretty quickly. And for a veteran who's maybe starting a career in consulting, what advice would you have for them on their first 90 days in the job and to how to best utilize that time to, to set them up for success in their career? Yeah, I'd, um, the first thing I would say is, is be patient. Um, the, you know, you're not going to step right out of business school and step into something that's, um, that's a, a leadership role like you, you had in the past, but that's okay because um, the, the, the lack of comfort in, and the challenges you'll face are important because it's filling a gap. It's filling things that others that didn't serve, that went and worked at banks or worked in industry, worked on while we were serving. And so be patient with that phase um, and pick and choose the, the elements maybe, you know, that, that aren't so obvious to you to, to start to differentiate yourself. And what I mean by that is we have a sense of ownership and, and actionability about us you know, when you're given a mission that others maybe don't have. So whatever you're given, whatever... Um, part of a case you're given, um, whatever training you're in, attack it like you would a mission uh, in your prior life. And, and the other is is that you know you don't have to have direct hierarchical lines of, of leadership reporting to you for you to bring your leadership to bear. And so you'll you'll I, I found I was missing this about three months in at Bain because we were on a really bad case. Um, you know, the 100-hour week type, the manager was, was I guess to be PC, was, was, was a challenge. Um, the partner was kind of detached, and so the team was kind of on this island just getting killed, you know, um, and didn't feel like we had great direction. And I found myself in the room kind of complaining with everybody else when it got really bad, and um, and it was a, a weird moment where I was, you know, two in the morning in the office realized that I was complaining with people that were, you know, 22, 23, the, I was reporting to someone who was five years younger than me on the case team, and it just struck me that that group, even though I was more junior as a part of the team, they needed direction and they needed someone to anchor the morale and the, the attitude. And I started to try to kind of reverse what I had been doing already, which was complaining with everybody else, and started to notice that um, I was able to develop a presence because, you know, I'd been there before. That case team might as well have been in, you know, trying to fix some pump in the engine room of a, of a sub on, on, on mission. And then people were frustrated that they were there and that things weren't going the way they wanted. Um, and, and that lesson, I think, helped me get promoted faster at Bain because I started to lead on teams outside of the reporting structure just because I was able to be a, a, for, a kind of a, a mature force on the team at times. And... Um, and kind of help drive attitude before I was able to, to add value at a leadership level from the work, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I think both of those pieces of advice are so solid. And I love that thought of, because um, I can see that in my own life as well, where you kind of rely on the old hierarchy or the old reporting structure, rather than realizing like, no matter what your capacity, no matter how junior your role, you can still be a leader, you can still, um, you know, it's a different form of leadership, maybe without the positional authority, but you can still exhibit that care for team and ability to influence the situation, even though your title might not reflect that. And I think, uh, you know, some people will laugh at this because I'm not, you, you can't be perfect. You, you, you can't have a perfect attitude all the time, but I think um, veterans probably recognize more than most the importance of um, positivity and, and, and keeping attitude um, focused and um, healthy because, you know, you've seen it where if you let that break down, negativity and, and, and it can be kind of a sickness that, that becomes pervasive and, and it's really hard to reverse. You've seen it on subs or in units or out in the field and um, I would not hesitate to, to bring those lessons to bear um, and, and be that kind of mature force of positivity because then people will start to, to rely on you. You may not have the skills or you know, in consulting and I didn't know how to do a lot of the cases and I didn't have a lot of the, the experience but you certainly can find, you can be someone that people rely on because you're mission-focused and you're, you're kind of a mature, positive force. So, 
And what was a mistake that you made while at Bain that you learned something from that you would want to share with listeners? Um, I think uh, I think I got a little bit impatient in the beginning. Um, I, uh, I I think about eight nine months into my time in Bain, I got frustrated and started to to look um, for for a job because I was convinced I wanted line experience and I wanted to um, get out and work for a, a company and start a career in, in industry and. Um, Luckily, I had some mentors back at Darden that, that told me, you know, you have one chance to leave Bain, make sure, make sure it counts. And others, you know, at Bain that were that, that I confided in that I was thinking about leaving that, that you know, recommended that I stay patient. And you know, I was lucky; it's more of a close miss than it was a um, a real mistake. Because coming out of that and being patient and, and driving to where I ended up in, in my time at Bain uh, yielded incredible results. The, my, the last. Um, five years I had at Bain after that moment were probably the best um, professional learning experience I, I could have ever dreamed of and, and resulted in, in where I am now and the job I ended up getting when it was time to go. Um, and I think that the, the memorable point of advice there is, is, and I think this goes all the way back to people considering leaving the arm, armed services, is make sure that it, when you're at those transition points, that, you kind of ask yourself a binary question, which is, am I running away from something or am I running to something? And, you know, I, I found that, you know, when you're, um, you know, just full disclosure, the last day on the, the submarine when I left, I, I walked out, it was in the shipyard, and I had to kind of take a knee in between two Connex boxes. So I was holding this box of stuff. I just, in formation, kind of said goodbye to the sub. And um, huge emotional experience for me. I was... Um, really sad to leave it's it's you know even i get sad kind of thinking about it right now because i really love those guys and um you know but what made everything successful after that i'm convinced is that i wasn't running away from from that uh from from that sub and that crew or the life in the navy i was at that point i found something that won out and i was running to um same thing happened at bain that uh you know that time when i started to interview and started to look to leave in that first year it would have been a huge mistake if I would have left because I would have been running away from the fact that I was frustrated in an individual contributor role or I had one bad case that, that had me, um, you know, in a, in a bad headspace. Um, but instead of, of that being patient and when it was time to go, I didn't even have a resume ready when I when I took this most recent job because the opportunity came up and it was, I was very happy at day and I wasn't running away from it. And so it's just an ongoing theme. I think it works both when you're leaving the service and when you, you make career changes. Yeah, I think that's such great advice, that thought of running towards, not away, or um, the role that fear plays in our life, not letting fear dictate our decisions, but rather like desire or excitement or, or those more positive things. And, and that leads me to the thing I was going to ask next, which was, what did bring you to Marion Technologies? It's, um, yeah, it's, uh, I was uh, leading... Um, an integration for Mirian. Mirian um, acquired a, um, a, a competitor company and Bain was brought in to, to lead the integration work. And so um, I basically was, was working with the executive team over a period of time um, on this case. I really clicked with that team and then there was an opening in the position I'm in now. Uh, one of the executives left and, and I got a call from the CEO asking if I would like to uh, like to come join join the team, and um, I can say this on the podcast because I say it to, uh, to to people around here. I, I spent the first weekend talking to my wife, and we were pretty happy at Bain, and left you know three days of talking about this, saying you know we're just going to stay at Bain, um, and then uh, I spent about a week talking to mentors, everything from uh, a brother in law to people that I trusted at Bain to you know, friends going back to Northwestern and, and others. And the more I, I had these conversations with people, the more, as I described, what the job would be um, to them, it was just an incredible opportunity. And I realized that um, you know, those, these things don't come around all the time. And even though I'm happy at Bain, it was um, time to kind of jump into a new challenge. And the, the only downside I had as I thought about the Mirian offer was um, Back to your point, uh, that that 
fear point, a, a fear of the unknown, fear of am I good enough and can I, can I step into this important role and do well by the people that um, will be a part of the business I'm kind of in charge of and you know, the livelihoods on, on the line and all those different things. And, um, you know, it's that kind of fear. And if that was it, I just kind of said to myself, well, then that's just a sign that it, it's time to step into something else and push myself and, you know, might as well be one of those first cases at Bain or the, um, the first networking event at Darden where I was uh, kind of afraid of my own shadow for the first time ever, you know, didn't know what to say to people at, at, from the different companies that were visiting and um, just going where you're, you know, not being afraid to challenge yourself and, and um, having the courage. And so not that I'm some, you know, brave human being. It was a great job offer, um, <coughs> but, but uh, I wasn't going into battle. But I, I, I think um, when I realized one of the only negatives was was just fear of the unknown. It was just time to jump. And, like, it's, you know, I'd say I'm really happy about the fact of where my career is ended up because, you know, I had a similar moment to the uh, – hiding between the connex boxes in the shipyard um, of emotion leaving Bain that, you know, these are great people. These were, it became a family. Uh, everything I hoped about the culture for Bain came true um, more than I could have even imagined. And so, you know, as you're grading the, the choices you make in life, I, I was able to look at another chapter and say, wow, I'm emotional leaving this place because it's special to me and, and you know, kind of guess that's a sign of success. So... And, and how would you explain Marion Technologies to a veteran listening? Yeah, so it's, um, Marion's a, an engineering firm, effectively, that has uh, a number of different business units all focused on radiation detection. And so, you know, for the, any nukes that are listening, um, you know, we make, um, the, the health physics business makes everything from dosimetry to area monitors and, and um, you know, survey meters and those types of things. And so things that we used on the, on the submarine. Um, but it's a, it's a company focused on um, innovative engineering, and so you have quite a few people with, with quite a bit of experience. It's a niche industry, and so a lot of the, uh, the, the people in, in health physics and then the other divisions in the company have, have been here for you know, decades and, and are the inventors of, of the technology that we're selling in a lot of cases and have the patent. And so it's a um, uh, very unique global company, so we have facilities all over the world, um, and uh, it's, you know, it touches everything from homeland security to military to um, commercial nuclear power, and, and so for pretty diverse customer set as well. So it's a, and then I think the last thing I'd say is it's a, you know, a smaller company, and so um, very strong um, culture and, um, and mission, so for me it's kind of a perfect mix of kind of technical challenges as well as um, a pretty tight-knit group that, that treats work like, like family. So um, checks off quite a few um, boxes in what I'm looking for when I went back to that submarine analogy I said of being stuck underwater with people you can trust. And what's your day-to-day life look like? I think it's always helpful for listeners to see you're president of a very large division at a, at a very large company, what that translates to in terms of what you do day to day and what your lifestyle looks like. Yeah, so, yeah, it's interesting. I think day to day, um, right now we're still working through integration. I'm working through getting up to speed, um, you know, day to day has shifted a little bit. So for Bain, I was very focused on the things I needed to get done. I needed to get the team done to answer a specific Set of you know questions or issues for for a client. Here, um, my day to day is focused more on um, you know it, it, a lot of time I spend is spent on frankly how I spend my time. If that makes sense. So <laughs> there's there's a uh, there are a million pulls and draws in my time, and um, one of the biggest challenges I have is is structuring things in a way where I'm 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 dedicating my bandwidth to the most important things. And the reason why I say that to answer your question is, is because of that, no day looks the same <laughs> for me. Um, right now, I, I, you know, one day could be me in, in the south of France visiting our our facility there and working with with um, my my team that that's over in France on, um, you know, the, some some org design changes that we're talking about for the division. Another day, I'll be in um, in Finland working through one some of our um, strategic products that we're developing and selling and um 
you know, if I'm back here in the office in Atlanta, um, more generically speaking, um, try to find time to get away from the, the computer and 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 calls and, and walk around. And frankly, that's my my favorite part. Um, you know, going out to the to the to the lab, which is the area where we do um, some some engineering work on products before shipping them. And you know, joking around about uh, being a miserable Detroit Lions fan or, or or what have you, and trying to connect. It reminds me of uh, touring on the sub, which is uh, kind of brings me full circle back to um, the, the things I really enjoyed as a, as a leader in the Navy. And so. I'm not sure if that really answered the question. It yeah. made me realize as I was answering it that I need to get more detailed so I can actually structure my days better and answer those questions in the future. <laughs> what about how have you found that leadership uh, outside of the military differs from uh, leadership within the military? Um, yeah, it's it's a it's interesting. It's a little um, first and foremost, leadership outside has um, different in incentives that go with it and so not that it's the biggest thing it's just one thing to take take into consideration that um in the military everyone was on in a bracketed structured pay structure and got promoted at the same time and so promotions and um incentives by 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 that i mean pay and bonuses and salary and those types of things those are in people's hierarchy of needs here and it's a it's a lever that doesn't exist in the military that that you need to 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 be aware of um as a leader in in business outside the navy but that said um that that becomes a small part if if you stay true to some of the things we we learned in our time in, in the service which is um you know to 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 truly motivate people and um and uh Get, get people um, excited to do their jobs without you know using monetary um, uh, monetary incentives. You, you have to um, empathize with them, and you have to get to know them. You know, you have to avoid hierarchical views of you know just because I'm wearing a khaki belt on a submarine, and people call me sir, that I instantly have their respect. So here's the same thing. Just because you know, being if I was a manager, didn't mean that the the 22 year olds out of the top schools in the country that were probably smarter than me, they're probably not going to instantly respect you unless you earn it. Um, the same holds true in this, this the, the new job here at Marion. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, I was in the Pentagon. Um, I got asked the question from a very senior um, uh, admiral, you know, what I thought leadership was. And I think I said something along the lines of taking care of your people and what's corrected to say, you know, people have families and parents to do that. Um, you know, leadership really is um, just fostering an environment where people can, um, you know, grow and succeed and, you know, have fulfilling um, careers. And that's uh, that's kind of stuck with me, and I think that's certainly true here as well. And, you know, my job, if I do it well, is to create an environment where people um, continue to grow and and succeed and get energy from that. And um, I think the people that are listening to us that that are that are veterans, they'll feel that that that's something that that is true across um, both armed services as well as um, um, you know what what we're doing now afterwards. So. Yeah, I love that. I love that thought that like there there are families in place to to look after people because I've said that a lot as well. Like, oh, taking care of my people, and and you know, for myself, I kind of transitioned about a year ago to this this um, goal of you know helping to challenge and support every member of my team to reach their full potential, and um, you know, just viewing it as an opportunity at work to make them you know, better at the job that they do, better in their career, better citizens, better people, but just really fostering that environment of of both challenge and supporting them to achieve that. And I love, you know, I love the way that you explained it as well, which is it is it is even um, it seems more powerful and specific and actionable than just taking care of people. It's like even not just taking care of them, but um, helping them to achieve that next level. And I, I love that. And if you think about it, like we spend such a huge percentage of our time away from from family when we work and from other priorities in our life. If you don't have a family, whether it's, you know, training for a triathlon or what, what have you. And, um, you know, the biggest risk when you get out of the uh, uh, out of the service is thinking, OK, now I'm going to have this normal lifestyle. No more deploying, no more. 
going out to sea, uh, being away, because it, it, frankly, that stayed the same. So it's, it's um, you know, I was consultant and traveled usually on a weekly basis, and now I'm traveling all over the world for this new job, and, and I'm distracted by the responsibility and things that I have to do here. And, um, it's, it's important to remember that that's the same for everyone you, you work with, and and if you're not creating an exciting experience and an energizing, fun, happy um, time at, at work, then you know that can be a real drag for someone. I, you know, I'm away from my family. I'm away from the things that I really truly prioritize in life. I don't want to be here. That you know, there's no bonus or salary that can ever get around that if you create a bad environment. And um, it's frankly um, something I, I I struggle with, and I think others may as well. And I did on the sub too. As a leader in that environment, you have to be careful and watch out for yourself as well. And so what I mean by that is um, I, I find that I struggle, and this is, this is something that I think, going back to the sub I did, I, I struggle with the responsibility that goes with what I was just describing um, being front of mind for me to the point where um, I don't recognize it for myself, too, that there's a balance and um, you owe multiple stakeholders, including your family, your time and that leadership piece you asked about, um, I think has created a DNA in, in, in a lot of us where we recognize the stakes. And um, if you're not careful, um, the last thing you'll learn when you get out of the military is, is work-life balance, and that's the uh, that's the hardest thing to to fix if it goes south. Um, I had, uh, someone told me at, at during the game came and gave a speech, and they they talked about life. You're constantly juggling multiple things, you're juggling your health, you're juggling your family, you're juggling your, your faith, if that's something that's important to you, and your career, and only one of those things that's not made of made of glass is, is your career. Um, and so, <laughs> random, uh, random uh, work-life balance quote there, but as a leader, to, you have to realize that all the things I said are important, but um, you have to make sure that creating that environment and, and serving as that leader doesn't cause you to be blind to your own own balance. Mm, I love that. Um, are there any resources, Mike, that you would recommend to listeners? I, I know you've learned so much on the job and in your incredible experiences, but I'm curious if there's any book or website or podcast or any other resource that a listener could check out today that might help them in their, their civilian career. Yeah, I um, I I'm I really listen to a lot of uh, Tim Ferriss right now. Um, it's a um, Tim Ferriss is kind of someone who works through you know kind of life experimentation, and I find a lot of it to be applicable. He wrote the um, Four Hour Work Week, Four Hour Body, and the, those types of things. And he he his podcast format is is inviting um, you know people who have excelled in their field, everything from actors to um, business leaders and just basically asks them what led to their success in, in a very tactical way. And so I found that to be helpful in this. When I listen to that, I, I think back and wish I would have had something like that to, to listen to when I was transitioning in, in at Darden. Um, I, uh, I, I find that outside of that, um, um, I, I, I try to, one thing I didn't do when I was in the, in the, uh, in the armed, armed forces was, was read, have, you know, kind of find three or four current events, um, resources that you read on a day to day basis. So I, I, I try to, at least at a minimum, this is such a bit cliche business school thing, but I try to read the front page of the journal every day. Um, I use a, a resource called utility dive, which is, um, um, a summary of the, the utility space and you can pick and choose your articles, which is important for my, my new role if someone's transitioning to the energy space. And then, I, you know, this doesn't exactly answer your question, but um, I would recommend that people keep mentorship uh, relationships alive each step of the way because the most invaluable resource that I, I find is having sounding boards of people that I trust to uh, to, to listen to and, and coach me along the way because, you know, I, I still, I feel like as I go on, I ask for more advice and more help, not less. And so um, you can't be the good friend or mentor that knows you to um, confide in as you're, you're making the transition and, and just once you make it as well to try to, to chart your course. I love that. And I, I, um, 
like that too when you were talking about the transition from Bain to Marian Technologies, how you and your wife had reached a conclusion and then the, these mentors were able to challenge you and help you look at things from a different perspective that ultimately led you to push things outside of your comfort zone. And so I, I really like that thought of the role that mentors can play in, in really challenging us to take those steps that we might be uncomfortable with. Um, I always like to end on an open-ended question, and that's just any final words of wisdom. I, I know that we've, you know, I've asked very specific questions about your time at Bain and Miriam, and um, just wondering, you know, whether it's personal or professional advice, what else you'd want veteran listeners to to know or to think about? Yeah, I think um, a couple things come to mind on that front. First, um, don't be shocked when you find yourself. Um, literally a, a afraid and feeling um, it's a little bit of an inferiority complex. You know, no matter how successful you were in the military, I, I think one thing I've noticed is this um, um, feeling of, you know, everyone around me has prepared for this and I, I'm just starting and, and I'm behind type feel. Um, that, that certainly happened at Darden and you see it in, in business schools when I go back to, to recruit or to talk to people. You see a little bit of this aura of um, feeling like you're you're, on, you're you're outmatched a little bit when you get started. Don't don't be don't be afraid or of that fear. To see that it's happening and recognize it, and then quickly find a way to remember everything that you've done in your life and um, and and lean on that that um, those experiences and the great things that you've done, and recognize that it's okay to be afraid. Drive let it, let it be a driver. Let it push you. Let it let it uh, let it be a source of energy. But then quickly put it behind you because if you let it happen too long and you and you you feel like you're um, playing a rigged game and, and you start to 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 um, use it as an excuse or it starts to hold you back and become too much of a headwind, then then it becomes a shame. In the beginning, it can be helpful. But in the end, though, it becomes uh, tragic. Um, the, the other thing I, I would say is that. Uh, you know, this is this is a tough thing to phrase, but um, remember, in your life, yeah, you're going to have multiple chapters, and you're you know you're going to develop to become a lot of different things. You know, you happen to have been a vet um, and served, which is something very unique and very special that um, make makes you uh, sacrifice and stand out in a way that others others don't. But um, Take that, internalize it, be proud of it, but don't let that define just entirely who you are. Recognize that if that's a, uh, if you use it instead as a launching pad and a core or an anchor for you, and add on to it, and become you know multiple different things in your life. You know you don't always have to be the vet. Um, when I say that, I always hesitate because I don't want it to sound like um, you shouldn't wear it on your sleeve with pride. You know what you've done and that you served, but um, that doesn't have to be all that you are. And, and if you use it as a source of confidence, get through that fear that I mentioned, then it, it really can be a building block to being a lot of different things. And um, I, I think I refer to it sometimes, and I talk about it more in this job than I did in the, in the past. But, um, you know, you have to work a little bit hard to, to shape yourself into becoming more than, than, than just, um, just the vet. I hope that doesn't sound bad, but, um, you know, you shouldn't – limit yourself inside those walls instead use it as a core oh i totally agree and i think one of the themes that's come up on the show is how um how identity shifts and how big of a role um identity plays in the military and then when you transition out it's almost like a scramble to establish a new identity and then most people it sounds like you know start to um, re-add that in as one other facet of who they are and an important component, but but realizing that I, I love the way you put it, over time you do develop different pieces, you do develop new facets and um, making room for all of them. And I think that there's room for all of them to be complementary and to play a role without any single one defining all of who you are, because that's just not, not true. We're so much more than any one individual piece. And, and I, you know, the linking the two, two thoughts together, I think some of the things if I were to do a post mortem on why I was afraid and feeling um, like I had a, 
um, inferiority complex in the beginning of Darden is because I looked around at a group of people that I just, I, you know, at the core, I didn't believe that they understood me or they knew what I had done and what I um, sacrificed. And so I had this gravity to the veterans group at Darden, which was a fantastic resource and a family to me because we, we understood each other. But as you transition to that, you know, evolving as a person, you know, they have a lot to learn. People that haven't served have a lot to learn from us, but don't forget, we have a lot to learn from them. There's perspectives that we weren't exposed to in our time uh, of service and um, embrace that. Don't just, if you, you know, people listening to this that go to business school, don't just dig in with the, the veterans group. Use that as a, a source of strength, but go out and, and jump into some of the associations that have nothing to do with your background or meet people that are um, u- unique from a perspective um, base and, and and then just kind of grow in all those different directions. And I think you'll be happy at the end. I think that relates well too to kind of a, a theme that seems like in your story is being able to get out of your comfort zone, being able to leave what is known and familiar and, and push yourself to grow outside of that. And I, I love that advice too about like the veterans club of like, yes, there's value there. And that's also kind of the warm blanket. That's the familiar. And so challenging yourself to find people with very different backgrounds. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you so much for your time, Mike. I appreciate all the advice and, and help you've been to the Beyond the Uniform community and uh, looking forward to seeing your continued success at Marion and, and where you go from there. No, thank, thank you very much for having me. I, and I, um, to all, all the, the veterans listening or the transition, transitioning vets to be, um, wish you all the, the, the best of luck and um, thank you to, to everyone for their service. Service, service, service. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Three important notes before you go. First, Audible.com is offering a free audiobook for Beyond the Uniform listeners. I love Audible. I get three books a month, and it's a great way to use net, or no extra time, to polish off books while you run, drive, etc. If you go to beyondtheuniform.io slash books, you'll not only find this offer, but you'll also find a list of every single book that has been recommended on this show. One in particular I'd recommend is The Hard Thing About Hard Things. This is a great story of determination and also a glimpse at what startups are really like. That's at beyondtheuniform.io slash books. Second, there are so many great resources out there for veterans, it can be difficult to know all about them. That's why at beyondtheuniform.io slash directory, you'll find a list of every single resource that's been mentioned on the show or that I've been able to find. You can also add your own if you find one I've missed. Lastly, I've put together several different free ebooks that provide data for veterans about their civilian career possibilities. This quantitative information serves as a great complement to the qualitative interviews I do each week. Go to beyondtheuniform.io, click on resources, and you'll be all set. Have a great week, and I'll be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career.